The guiding hand behind the push to make Ben-Hur overseas belonged to tiny June Mathis, a stage performer originally from Colorado. June arrived in New York with ambitions as tangled as her curls. Even in her fantasies, though, she could hardly have imagined the changes awaiting her in Hollywood. There'll be a change in the weather, a change in the sea. From now on, there'll be a change in me. My walk will be different, my talk and my name. There's nothing about me gonna be. June had paid her rent in Manhattan writing for magazines. One day, a staffer at Vanity Fair invited her to an after-hours tarot card session. There, her fate would be revealed. All she had to do, the tarot reader said, was get herself out to the hub of motion picture production in Los Angeles. There, she was destined to become the most powerful woman in the movies. As unlikely as it sounded, the prediction came true and spurred on June's lifelong flirtation with the occult. Focusing her efforts on writing film scenarios, June attracted attention at the Metro Studio in New York. Producers bought her script Toys of Fate for actress Ala Nazimova. Nazimova was already known to the public for performing in the plays of Henrik Ibsen. Now Metro wanted movie audiences to see her as a sort of foreign temptress. Toys of Fate was the ideal vehicle. Nazimova recognized June's value. She arranged for her to be hired by the Metro Story Department in Hollywood. Once June had made the move, she could be seen at night with Nazimova's inner circle of women. Often they dressed in heavy robes, decorated in gemstones and mystic Egyptian symbols. There in the dark, hidden canyons of the Hollywood Hills, they acted out their private ceremonies. During the day, June took production meetings and churned out dozens of scripts. Many a star on the Metro lot looked to her for help with their careers. Like many of the creative minds in Hollywood, June adored diminutive Buster Keaton, she was assigned to work on the script of his 1920 feature film debut, The Saphead. Keaton played a pampered rich man's son, and June's adaptation underscored his struggle for self-assertion. On the other end of the male confidence spectrum stood Francis X. Bushman, at one time known worldwide as the handsomest man in movies, Bushman's career had been scuttled by a very public infidelity scandal with longtime co-star Beverly Bain. June was assigned to help Bushman and Bain fulfill their obligations to Metro with a series of light romantic comedies. Somewhere along the way, she made a mental note to herself if ever she needed an overbearing male villain for a future project, Bushman would be the choice. Still, the most toxic personality in Hollywood had to be Eric von Stroheim. June found herself in charge of whittling down his marathon drama, Greed, to less than half of its six-hour running time. The experience served as a reminder that the movie business would always be a trade-off between artistic vision and commercial calculation. With the executive title of Artistic Supervisor, June was the highest-paid female executive in Hollywood. 
As such, she was constantly on the lookout for new talent and direction. During her years on stage, June had toured in plays with America's foremost female impersonator, Julian Eltinge. In 1920, Eltinge arrived in Hollywood to star at a rival studio in a comedy titled An Adventurous. At a screening, June had to have noticed the young man playing the antagonist. Rudolph Valentino had appeared in two dozen features by then, but now even a fake mustache couldn't conceal his magnetism. June was hard at work on her most ambitious production to date. Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse was a literary property, and June knew it would need more oomph on screen. She was willing to bet her future at Metro that Valentino could provide that heat. She cast him in the role of the novel's ne'er-do-well son, Giulio, beefing up the part into a head-turning showcase. She underscored Valentino's sultry appeal with a seductive tango. And then with a nod perhaps to her friend, Julian Eltinge, she even added some high-spirited cross-dressing. Four Horsemen was a box office gold mine for Metro and for June. Every studio wanted its own million dollar girl. So when Valentino left Metro and signed with Goldwyn, June was lured there too with the promise of better projects and more control. Little did she know that that would soon include Ben-Hur. Once at a party, June spoke of a dream she'd had. She was handed a gift by a stranger and was feeling so pleased until suddenly. For months, she assumed it was a flashback to her experience with von Stroheim and greed. But with time, she saw it was really a premonition of Ben-Hur. Broadway producer Abraham Erlinger guarded the book's dramatic rights. All Hollywood turned out for the auction, but Erlinger waited for Goldwyn Pictures to make the highest bid. Goldwyn could have the rights, he said, but only on condition that its golden girl, June Mathis, oversee every aspect of the production. As a project, Ben-Hur never meant as much to June as did Four Horsemen, but in one way it probably meant more. All the active new studios in town were being run by men now. That meant June had a chance to show them all what a female executive could do. Goldwyn had sunk $600,000 just in the rights to Ben-Hur alone, the equivalent of over $10 million today. The only way to make a return on their investment was by filming abroad. June proposed partnering with a studio in Italy and cutting corners with mainly second-tier Hollywood talent. For director, Goldwyn pushed for Rex Ingram, who had made Four Horsemen a hit. But he and June had had a falling out over the editing of Greed. She chose instead Charles Braben, a British outsider who somewhat shared her interest in the occult. Braben was known for running a rather loose set, especially since his marriage to screen vamp Theda Berra. But he could be had at a fraction of the cost of other directors, and June knew she would be there in Italy helping him call the shots. As for the cast, insiders were stunned by her choice of B-list leading man George Walsh to play Judah Ben-Hur. They were equally shocked at her choice of Francis X. Bushman as the villain, Masala. Production crews began arriving in Rome in late 1923, 
All principal actors were there by April, but shooting was delayed by supply shortages, labor strikes, and bad storms. For June, the biggest shock was finding herself in a serpent's nest of backstage intrigues. Goldwyn executives never intended to honor the terms of June's contract. They resented her being installed as the de facto head of production. Managers preferred having a company man like Braben rather than someone they might not be able to control. In the midst of it all came a corporate merger with all the markings of a takeover. June Mathis and her friend George Walsh were removed and Charles Braben was replaced as director by Fred Niblo. June returned to Hollywood crushed and defeated. Her sole consolation prize was Italian filmmaker Silvano Balboni as her fiance. She continued to write scripts and even had two comedy hits with actress Colleen Moore. But a new premonition of perhaps living on borrowed time seized hold of June. Out of the blue, she paid for family crypts at a Hollywood cemetery. And when Rudolph Valentino died unexpectedly in 1926, she offered his family one of those crypts until other arrangements could be made. Early in 1927, June learned of a congenital heart condition. She had a brief hospital stay to adjust the problem, and then within months, she was back at work, attending a stage performance in New York with her mother when she suffered a fatal heart attack. She was 38 years old. I'm gonna name 